So I'm going to look uh, quickly through, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the structure and format of the listening section of the test, I'll speak very briefly about the three types of listening passages used in the test. There are different organizational structures used to present information, and this is something that I think is probably not enforced enough by teachers who uh, take students in the standardized tests because every time we read or listen to information that information is presented using an organizational structure which actually helps students if they can recognize the structure to take very effective notes if you're delivering a description of something you're going to listen for examples that um, of, of that of the, the of the description. If you're listening for something about classification, you might be looking for different types or as the introduced categories of something. Um, so organizational instruction it structures are very important in the listening section, but they also benefit students in the reading section as well. I'll run through the eight types, uh, question types that a candidate encounters on the TOEFL test. They have different names depending on sources that you, uh, the, the source that you get them from, but I've used, I think, the most popular names here. So I'll run through briefly um, those. I think it's important that a student can quickly identify what the question itself is asking and keywords in the question will help that. Um, I'll go through answer options. Because the questions on the whole are multiple choice, uh, it's important that a student understands distractors. And this, again, is very uh, relevant for the uh, reading section also of TOEFL and paraphrasing. Paraphrasing is a skill that a student needs to understand um, in writing, reading, and certainly in listening. And then what, what you can do as a teacher. So I'll go on to the next part. So very quickly, uh, the listening section is the second section on the test. It comes after reading and before speaking and writing. Um, the student will need between an hour and an hour and a half to complete the section. The reason for this is ETS, the people who administer the TOEFL test, will often put in samples that are going to perhaps be tested for or used in future TOEFL tests. Now, the thing is the student does, the candidate in the test will never know which of the passages or which passages are actually part of the official test and which are samples that will go on to be studied and used uh, in by other TOEFL candidates. So it is really important that the student answers all of the, the, the questions and pays attention to all of not just the first 60 minutes and then thinking that the last three are samples. Um, so this is this also occurs in the reading section where the student a candidate may have extra reading passages. The listening section is between six and nine recordings, and in general, the recordings are between three and seven minutes in length. Seven minutes is a long time to be taking notes uh, and to be listening carefully to something. So I would also suggest when you teach, it's a good example if you use recordings to use recordings of different length. And it's okay to use recordings when you're teaching of quite a short length, when you're concentrating on a particular a question type that you want to review with the student. You can also, as I have done in the lessons that we've put on the site, use say one to one and a half minute uh, excerpts from a larger listening passage. And you can uh, test very, you can go through the main idea, you can go through the function questions, organization questions, and you can test the different types just using uh, the same excerpt because if you're going to make your own listening recordings, it's a very time consuming uh, process. Okay, there are three types of recordings, uh, very simply academic lectures, office hours conversations, and service encounter conversations. There's not a huge amount of difference, but there are more likely to be certain question types that come after particular uh, listening passages. And after listening to each of the recordings, the candidate has 20 minutes to answer. So the academic lecture recordings have six, and while the service encounter conversations and office hours and conversations, which are non-academic topics, will have five questions each. Okay, so as well as the question types, um, the three types of listening passages that I mentioned, we have uh, office hours conversation. These are basically a non-academic uh, 
uh, conversation, usually between a professor or a tutor and a student. And this is something that students will always do when they're on campus, is they will have a need to obviously discuss an assignment or perhaps go back and asking for an extension on a paper, perhaps asking or requesting clarification, for example, in, a, in an essay, sorry, in a lecture that was delivered previously. And so there's a lot to and fro. You will always be asked a purpose question, by the way, in an office hours conversation, because it's always to find out why the student is going to see the uh, professor. Surface encounter are, again, non-academic. These are all of the things that relate to the support services that will support an academic life on campus. So a lot of these are around things like housing, to do with the library, perhaps something in the cafeteria, uh, employment, perhaps even on campus. Um, and again, there'll always be a purpose question for this type of uh, lecture. The academic lectures obviously are commonly used. Um, they will always be from, uh, they're from a wide uh, range of academic disciplines. Um, and one thing in the academic lectures is there are actually three types within those as well, although the student will quickly recognize these. Um, the academic topics, for example, you are not, the student is not expected to have an academic understanding of the topic itself. The topic will always be an introductory lecture to the particular topic. So I always say that it would be understood if you decide to go ahead and make your own recordings or when you're finding recordings to use, the listening passage should be understood by an educated person who has no prior understanding on the topic. So you or I may not know anything about um, I don't know the, the, the decline of the ice age, but we would be under be able to understand the recording and take the main points and supporting details from it as we went through. So one thing you'll notice in TOEFL is they tend to avoid anything like jargon or technical terms. If those terms appear, they will actually here for the student also uh, on, on the test, and that goes for the reading section of TOEFL. So one thing that I quickly like to do for students is you want them to be able to identify recordings as quickly, sorry, the types of uh, recording as quickly as possible. So I always throw a couple of transcripts in for them, and it's just an excerpt. These I've just made up and ask the student why, in which would they appear office hours conversation, academic lecture, or a service encounter, and then perhaps get them to think about what would come next in those. How would you resolve this? You can role play all of this stuff, and I think that's a really good way, perhaps not the academic lecture so much, but certainly because office hours conversations and service encounters are in a more conversational style, then I think it's great to role play because you're going to start to elicit the language that the student already knows, and for students to start to obviously predict what may come next in listening passages. Okay, academic lectures, there are three types. It's not really necessary to focus on these, although it does become important when it comes to attitude questions for the integrated lectures and in-class discussions. So in the professor's lectures, um, sorry, so this is a sub, I guess if you like, a subset of the academic lectures. There are three, um, three types within the academic lectures, one in which only the professor talks, then there are what's called integrated lectures, so the speaker is speaking, most of the primary speaker speaks for the majority of the time and students may ask a question or respond to a question that the professor asks, and thirdly an in-class discussion where you may have at most two other students um, responding again, to questions the professor asks or asking questions to the professor. And these two are interesting for the attitude questions because the professor uh, obviously delivers a response to an, a, an answer that the student gives and which may sometimes reveal something uh, for an attitude question or an in, in inference question. Um, okay, on to the organizational styles. Again, I... I kind of emphasize this when I said about what we're going to cover today. I believe that teaching organizational styles is very important for the reading section, for the writing section, 
and for the listening section because students often don't spend a lot of time doing this. They're so busy just listening to the details that are given in a lecture that I think if you can identify the organizational style, it helps with your note taking. Whether you divide everything into columns, whether you do bullet points, and note taking is essential in the listening section because one thing that I was, uh, I, I knew about it before I took the TOEFL test, but I was still kind of surprised when it came time to take uh, answer the questions, um, I wasn't able to go back and hear the listening uh, passage again. So you hear the listening passage once, that's done, and then you must answer the questions in order. You can't go back like in the reading section and change your answers to the questions. The listening, you must answer the question, you must confirm that that's the, the correct answer you wish to give, and then you proceed to the next question. So if you get the organizational style wrong at the beginning and you don't take notes in an efficient way, it does hinder, hinder answering the uh, questions that will come after the passage. So the uh, organizational styles that I think you should uh, enforce with the student or uh, uh, um, impart to the student, uh, compare and contrast, definition, which is generally just an introduction to a topic and examples of it, process. I don't find it very often in sample TOEFL text, but obviously um, it would be more of an engineering type thing or a medical thing perhaps. Classification, which is quite common in the TOEFL listening passages. Theory and support, which is an interesting one, um, and that often appears in writing section as well. Advantages and disadvantages and cause and effect. That could also read causes and effects. Um, because generally there are multiple effects for a particular cause that comes along. So I'm going to go through the uh, organizational styles now. Classification, very clearly, as soon as the student represent, a student, sorry, there are some uh, words that may appear in a listening passage that will prompt the student to understand the organizational style. So here uh, at the bottom of the slide, you can see I've got the teacher, the lecturer may say different forms of, various types of, one type of. These are prompts that should lead the student to identify that the organizational style is one of classification. And when that occurs, then the student should quickly write up some columns here or a table and start to fill in the table. Not just do the table, they need to take in other details as well, but the main points in classification will always fit neatly into a table. The next style, as I mentioned previously, is compare and contrast. Uh, linking words will appear here, conversely, in contrast to um, differences between a comparison of. If a student gets this, they will want to write down the notes and the contrasting. I find that um, abbreviations, plus and minus, or ticks and crosses is, is a good thing when you're taking notes for compare and contrast. You've got a process here. As I said, I haven't come across these too often, but these always contain uh, transition words that show sequence. So first, second, third, finally, afterwards. Um, we're all familiar with these ones here. So if the student hears these words, um, it's a good idea that they're going to have process and writing down the steps in the process would be the best way to take notes during the listening passage. Theory and support is quite common. The word theory will appear and then evidence supporting that theory or disproving or disagreeing with that theory uh, will be the detail that supports the main ideas, the key points in the text. Definition is another common one where you just, a uh, teacher is explaining a discovery, um, something I think, uh, for example, you, uh, it might be just a description of an art, uh, an art school or an art period, for example, or a type of a species of animal, new species of animal, something like that. Um, or uh, so you see here the language is a lot more general um, but again they need to write down the main definition the, the, which will often be paraphrased uh, and from there they can then note examples of that particular thing that is being defined. Advantages and disadvantages I find also is not used that regularly, but the words that will always come up in something like this are the advantages and disadvantages or the pros 
and cons of a system. So it does appear, as I've mentioned here, that advantages and disadvantages is similar to a compare and contrast, but compare and contrast will compare two or three different things, while advantages and disadvantages will simply look at one point and note the pros and cons of that. So that's the difference between those two organizational styles. Again, <clears throat> if the student hears the words advantages, disadvantages, it should be, the student should be writing a table or columns with the pros and cons, again, plus or minus, and taking the notes, <coughs> excuse me, that way. Cause and effect, this one's quite easy. It can appear a little bit similar to a process, but you will have the teacher using verbs, sorry, the professor in the lecture using words that are showing exactly a cause and effect. So you've got things taking place that might lead to, that, that will in, 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 uh, cause something to uh, happen. Okay, the question types, there are eight question types. We have the purpose questions. These look at the main reason of an entire lecture or conversation. So they generally start with the word why. Okay, pretty simple one there. Um, I'm going to go and compare those to another type of question where there's a why, the function question, um, but a function question is slightly different to a purpose question. Attitude questions, you're looking at the speaker's point of view, and these will often be asked in the integrated lectures or the in-class discussions where you have more than one speaker um, in, in the listening passage. So the, those ones where you have more than two speakers, more than one speaker, they're a good opportunity to look at people's different attitudes on the subject. An inference question, these are one of the more difficult ones to teach. And what I tend to do when I come to it is I show you, I actually get the student to try to create his or her own inference questions. Um, I actually find these the most challenging uh, as a teacher to teach in any case. Um, so the student needs to draw a conclusion based on the information. And it's obviously, it can be a question about what is the most likely of these statements to be correct. We've got also main idea questions. This is, uh, again, based on the entire text, and the answer to a main idea question will generally appear in the first minute of the recording. Detail questions, uh, these are a pretty standard one about the actual facts that are presented in the listening passage. Function questions, as I um, compared to purpose questions, they will look at the purpose of a specific section of a conversation. And the final two question types, you have the organization questions, and this is how or why the professor introduces information. Um, and as I said, if you have allowed the student, if the student is feeling comfortable recognizing organizational styles already, then this question will be a lot easier to answer. Finally, you have the connecting content questions, and this is where you need to uh, complete the table. In a way, this connecting content question is almost like a multiple multiple choice question where you need to select various facts or true or false that have occurred, but it's more than one. You need to select in a way more than one answer option. Okay, so main idea, uh, it's a pretty easy one. Um, what we're going to talk about today and the question will always be something, what is the main idea in the question? So the first, if you're teaching a student this one, um, all you need to do is find have recordings that will look, if the recording is uh, three to seven minutes in length, the main idea generally appears in the first minute. Something that you would want to look out for is when the professor starts talking, uh, he or she may refer back to something that was uh, taught previously, and that can be a little bit of a distractor. So when the student's noting this down, be aware that the main idea may come after uh, the professor has spoken about something that occurred previously, or the, the, the professor may deliver an anecdote or even a little personal story before going into the main idea which relates to it. So they're two things to be aware of. Um, but you generally find that the professor introduces the main idea with very clear words, as you can see on the slide here. Okay, detail questions. These appear the most frequently. They 
uh, are there to garner the student's understanding of facts that are uh, the main facts or the important facts that support the, the main idea in the text. You were generally not asked about minor points, dates, names, things like that. Certainly not the spelling of a name because it's a listening passage. So you're really looking to um, provide the student's understanding of the actual facts that are presented in here. What um, you I think in general there can be between two and four. They're certainly the most common type to appear. Um, and what you want to do is students need to take very clear notes. Obviously, this supports this because the events and concepts that are explained will always have supporting details in them. One thing that's interesting in answer options for detailed questions is there are two things a student needs to be aware of. Um, they may have written down notes and then find that those answer options have exactly the same wording in them. That's one thing to be wary of. If they find that the answer option has exactly the same wording that the professor used in the text, this could actually be a distractor. Generally, and I say, yeah, generally, the correct answer to a detailed question will paraphrase the words that we of the professor. They won't use the exact words from the recording. Okay, purpose questions tend to appear in the non-academic topics, as I mentioned before, the surface service encounters and the um, office hours conversations. So student goes to speak to either a professor or um, a campus staff member or employee about something, and these always are very familiar topics. I don't find these difficult, and I don't think students find these generally a difficult one, um, and they generally start with the word why. Uh, it does mention in a number of sources that I looked at that purpose questions may not actually be stated. They might be inferred. So that's something to look out for. A professor may not necessarily say, why are you here to see me? Or the student may not say, I've, I've come to do such and such. But instead, they just start a general conversation. One thing you can listen for here in a purpose question is where the professor then asks a rhetorical question or tries to paraphrase what the student's issue is. And that's the best way sometimes to find the answer to a purpose question. Inference questions, as I said, what I often do here is provide a written text to start with when teaching these to students. Um, an inference obviously is requires the student to draw a conclusion from information that has been presented in the listening passage. And these are not particularly easy to do. So one good uh, practice activity that you can do for students is actually give them a text and then ask them to infer something and write their own inference question. And I find that's a good way for them to start to be able to um, <clears throat> answer the questions uh, because it's actually information in the sense that's missing but would naturally be inferred. And it's not an easy concept for students to necessarily grasp. Uh, I've got a whole lesson on the site about inference questions, so hopefully that will um, help some of you out as well. Function questions, as I mentioned before, are a little bit like purpose questions, but quest function questions do not look at the entire text. They look at the function, why is somebody saying this at a particular point in time? And we always say things for various reasons, whether we're, uh, as, as you can see on this slide here, um, uh, the function may be about agreeing with somebody, verifying somebody, clarification, rejection of something. And again, I start with some um, examples that I've done here. You can see A states something and B will either give some words and then ask the student to explain what the function of that language is. And I find that these are a good way for students to understand why or what is the relationship between the information. Obviously, in academic lectures, these are not used necessarily as much um, because there will only be one speaker in the professor's lecture speaking, but the, the, the speaker, sorry, the professor may ask a rhetorical question that is then used as a function question or may express, express attitudes such as disappointment, or maybe not disappointment, but doubt 
um, or rejection of a particular idea that has been uh, mentioned previously in the passage. Attitude questions, um, again, I introduce these with text-based things because to one question, you can reply with a lot of different words to show an attitude. So here, for example, I've, I've put down a particular question that somebody may ask, uh, if you work in an office environment, can you help me with the spreadsheet? And from A to D here, various office colleagues have given um, responses that very clearly show an attitude. So along with the words that show attitude, obviously intonation and tone are also very important. So you should practice those with the student. Um, intonation is changes rapidly. English is a highly inflected language, and most of the professors in the uh, academic lectures, it's quite obvious to see when they are changing their tone. Um, they're not generally monotonous speakers, and you'll see when they're asking rhetorical questions or uh, raising the intonation towards the end for questions and so forth. Uh, so that's what I use for attitude questions to start with. And then organizational questions, this really just comes back um, to looking at the relationships between ideas in the text. And organization questions, if you've looked at an organizational structure, then you're also going to make it easy for the student because those same things that they're listening for in organizational structure will show them how the ideas are, uh, what the, sorry, how ideas are related or the relationships between ideas. And these uh, generally um, start the, the organizational questions. One way to identify them is that the answer options generally commence with an infinitive. Why have they done, you know, why, what is the organization? It's by, uh, to, to, sorry, I've said that incorrectly. Um, how, how is the relationship, how are the relationships, uh, how are the ideas related? And you'll actually f perhaps start with by, by, um, yeah, sorry, I'm not, I'm getting myself in, in tied there, but that, uh, you'll find that there's answer options are quite clearly state or show the student that this is, is an organization question. Finally, there's the connecting content questions. And these ones generally appear if there's been a listening passage that shows uh, classification in particular, and where the student has been able to uh, write notes in a table, um, then you will find, for example, and one thing that I do here is just put a whole lot of things um, together and ask the student to try and in their own head work out how these could be classified. So obviously they may, may classify by uh, mammal, bird and insect, but they may also classify if they're really good by um, the physical location of where the, where the species is found. And in this case, it's Australia and uh, Africa. Um, you may not necessarily have that information at hand, but you can do that with various things. Because in an organization, sorry, in a connecting content question, you will have to ask, there may be tables that the student needs to fill in and will need to fill in two or three options, or there may be some statements that the professor um, said, and you have to say whether those statements, sorry, for example, whether those statements were said or whether they were not said, whether perhaps he discussed uh, a different medical procedure, whether he discussed the uh, diagnosis, whether he discussed the outcomes, and whether those subjects were actually dealt with uh, will need to be marked on a table. And in a connecting content question, the student has to answer all, it has to put in all of the correct items to receive any score on that question. Okay, so finally, I just want to run through when a student's looking at answer options. There are three things in particular that they will want to focus on. Um, and first of all, that will be that they're, again, their note taking is super strong. Uh, very good note take, very good note taking skills obviously will translate into being able to use short words. Symbols come in super handy with listening passages. Um, if the student sets up their own system, perhaps that you can help with pluses and minuses, um, ticks and crosses, arrows going up and down, directional arrows are very helpful. These help to denote attitudes and opinions, whether something is stated, whether it um, in a theory and support, I said when they, when, uh, um, and whether, whether that supports the theory or not. 
Um, so that's one thing I would say is that note taking always be enforcing good note taking skills in order for the student to best look at different options. The other thing is that as you're teaching all the different question types, always make sure that the student is understanding that there may be distractors. As native speakers, I've already said myself, uh, I've fumbled a few times during the presentation, is that we all have to correct ourselves when we're delivering a listening passage. And distractors are extremely common uh, in the listening passage. Somebody may stop, they may give a piece of information and then correct that information. But what's really important is in the answer options, there may be distractors as well. And I mentioned that these could be that the words, uh, the answer options use exact wording from the listening passage. That's a good idea. That's a good um, example of using uh, a distractor in the, in the answer itself. Uh, so one thing that you might like to do is you can set up, and it's quite easy to find your own recordings, putting distractors in them. Get the student used to listening for distractors because it is something that is quite commonly used. Um, and lastly, paraphrasing is probably the skill that is most required for a student um, to be able to recognize in the answer options. Again, this goes with the fact that uh, exact wording is rarely used for the correct answer option. And in fact, the answer options will generally paraphrase uh, what the professor or the students have said in the listening. So a good idea is as you're going through listening passages and listening to key points, you can often take the notes that the student has written and then look at synonyms that may uh, come out before even looking at the answers. So you could just look at the student's notes and then think about what other words, um, in particular verbs and adjectives that might be able to be used. So another thing that you can do with note taking is ask the student to summarize in their own words up from their notes to regurgitate that back to you and see if they can reconstruct the, the main ideas and the supporting details of a listening passage. This is a really good way to elicit um, synonyms and enable the student to practice paraphrasing. Okay, finally, what you can do as a teacher, obviously you can prepare your own materials. One thing that I would suggest is that with, although um, the vast majority of TOEFL recordings are in North, uh, are in uh, standard North American English, they do have other speakers on it. So don't hesitate if you're a, a non-American uh, speaker, uh, non, sorry, Ameri sorry, a North American uh, speaker, you, it's still good for you to uh, do your own recordings, and this allows you then to write your own questions. I recommend using both excerpts and entire passages. The reason is that when you're teaching, although it would be great for the student to always be listening to an authentic TOEFL text, the reality is that if you're teaching a student for uh, 40 or 50 minutes, you don't want necessarily seven minutes of that to be taken up in a single uh, a single exercise. So as I said, you can record entire passages, but then take excerpts of those because you can look at just doing, taking the first minute and examining that for the uh, purpose or the main idea questions, and then later parts of the, the entire text to look at um, function questions, attitude questions, organized questions, etc. cetera. Um, and that's what I've just mentioned there. Use the same excerpts over and over to teach multiple question types. Enforce note taking. I think it's the the most important skill to be successful in the entire test. Uh, it doesn't matter which section you're you're doing, and but in listening, it's vital because as I mentioned, you hear the listening passage once, and that's it. There's no other opportunity, and then come the questions. So uh, the the notes are vital to to answer the uh, listening questions. Um, I also think that from students' notes, after listening to a passage, something that helps other areas of the TOEFL test is once the student has produced those notes, ask them to do, as I mentioned before, recall what the listening passage was about. This is a really good exercise for paraphrasing and shows that the student can only use their notes. How much can they actually recall? But you could also do a written activity from this. 
because that's really what happens in the writing section of the TOEFL test where they have to, in the integrated task, which I won't speak about now, but this also supports the student's ability to answer uh, TOEFL writing questions. Um, obviously, I'm going to suggest that you use our site. We now have 10 lessons up that go through. There are two that introduce the listening section. Um, one goes through all the question types. The second lesson in the introduction just looks at the organizational style. Uh, I'll reiterate again how important I think that is for students and teachers to understand. And then there is a separate lesson for each question type that the student will find. And within each of those lessons, there will be distractors and paraphrasing to be tested as well. Khan Academy is a great thing. If you don't feel confident doing your own recordings, I recommend Khan Academy. Khan Academy for note-taking skills. What you can do, they have a wide selection um, of academic disciplines, usually introductory style passages. Some of you, I'm sure, already know of it. Um, it's wildly uh, popular. And uh, you can go in and ask the student to listen to a five-minute um, listening passage, take those notes, and then do a writing, or you can uh, get them to do a speaking activity from that. I think it's an excellent source of material to promote note-taking skills. Finally, the last thing I want to say is although we always encourage students uh, to listen, the best thing to, for, for comprehension is obviously for listening, uh, comprehension is uh, testing your listening skills is to listen to uh, authentic speakers. Be wary that TOEFL has very particular listening passages. You're talking about academic uh, style conversations or the office hours or service encounters. News and current affair programs, I don't think really are worth a lot for TOEFL students um, because the interactions in interviews is just simply too fast. And I think that they aren't really in the organizational styles. It's far more news and current affair programs are generally very, very free flowing uh, back and forth. Um, and they're rarely presented in the way that TOEFL information is. Obviously, that's better than using nothing, but I would use probably Khan Academy because it's far more structured in the way that TOEFL is, or again, uh, use our lessons if that's something that interests you. So I'm going to stop there. Um, but